How will Kamala Harris impact the 2024 election? You might be thinking, haven't you already done two of these videos, Mr. Stickman? The answer to that would be yes, but if you can't tell, quite a bit has changed since the last time I did one of these videos. Mainly that we had an assassination attempt on one candidate and that the other candidate was replaced entirely. Barring any extreme that no one sees coming, Kamala Harris has secured enough delegate support to be the 2024 Democratic nominee for president, replacing Joe Biden on the ticket. As of August 6th, she officially announced her running mate as 60-year-old Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz, who we'll talk about more later. Because we're about three months from election day and because she's not officially confirmed as a nominee yet, we need to wait for the convention for that to happen. My deep dive on Kamala's platform will be the very next video that I do, so stay tuned for that. Anyways, over on the Republican side, we've seen some change as well. Trump is still very much the Republican nominee, but he's officially announced his running mate as J.D. Vance, the 39-year-old senator from Ohio. Before Biden dropped out, all signs were pointing toward Trump being re-elected in a landslide. Now that Harris is the nominee though, there are a lot more questions than there were even a month ago. So how will Kamala Harris impact the 2024 election? What might her path to victory look like? Does she have a realistic path to victory? On top of that, how has Trump's path to victory changed since we last reviewed it? Let's dive in and do our best to answer all of these questions. This won't be a super long section, so don't go clicking away onto another video. Before getting into each candidate's path to victory, I want to first give you a little background on how Kamala Harris has already impacted the 2024 election. For one, let's just start by saying that most Democrats are just happy that Biden is officially off the ticket. That's not to say that all Dems view Kamala as their saving grace. It may be far from that, but polling from just before Biden dropped out of the race showed that nearly two-thirds of Democrats wanted him off the ticket. New excitement about Kamala translated into donations. According According to multiple reports, Harris raked in about $231 million on just the first day of her campaign, which was the biggest one-day donation haul of the entire 2024 election cycle. $81 million of those dollars came from small-dollar donations, while around $150 million came from big donors. For reference, one of Trump's biggest donation days came after he was found guilty in his criminal hush money trial. After the verdict, his campaign raised around $35 million in small-dollar donations. That gives you a sense of just how much money Harris has raised so far. Now, I said earlier that not all Dems view Kamala as their saving grace, which is true, but that doesn't mean the Democratic Party isn't behind her. She's received endorsements from the likes of Barack and Michelle Obama, Bill and Hillary Clinton, several Democratic state governors, a whole host of senators, and a boatload of representatives. If you want to see the whole list, check out the link in my sources down below. Even outside of the Democratic Party though, Harris is having an impact. And this is where we get into answering our first question. Does she really have a shot? The answer is a definite yes. While it's possible her momentum will slow, some of the polls we're seeing come out of swing states are truly insane in terms of how quickly Dems have turned things around. For reference, I'll be using real clear politics polling averages in this video. If you've got an issue with the numbers I'm about to report, don't argue with me, I'm just the messenger. We've got seven clear battleground states in the 2024 election. Pennsylvania, Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, and North Carolina. Before Biden dropped out on July 21st, Trump was ahead in polling in all seven of these states. His biggest leads were in both Arizona and North Carolina, where he was ahead by about six percentage points. In Michigan, he was ahead by about two percentage points. Then Harris joined the race. According to Real Clear Politics, the gap in Wisconsin has shrunk from a near 3% Trump lead to just 0.2%. Meanwhile, in Michigan, Harris is now leading by 2%. In Pennsylvania, Trump leads by just 2%. Now, another thing to note about these averages, they include polling from before Biden dropped out. If we look at specific polls that asked about Trump versus Harris, the picture changes even more. For example, a July 24th poll conducted by Fox News found that Trump and Harris were virtually tied in Pennsylvania. That same poll also found that the two were virtually tied in Michigan as well. Meanwhile, in Wisconsin, Fox found that Trump was ahead by just one percentage point. And now, a quick update as of recording this. New polling averages from Decision Desk HQ also show that polls have swung significantly in Kamala's favor over the past few weeks. These numbers don't mean she's leading in all seven swing states, but they represent how much ground she's made up on Trump in the polls. Considering she declared her campaign only a couple of weeks ago, I'm sure they love seeing these numbers. I will also say that these polling numbers are going to continue to change, so don't take what you see in this video as everything. It's even possible that by the time this video comes out, newer polls paint a different picture. I'm just going by what I have as of now. Once again, I'm not trying to say Harris is going to win this election, but because of the way the Electoral College works, these swing states are extremely important. Considering how close polling currently is in these states between Harris and Trump, I think it would be foolish for anyone to write off Kamala from winning this thing. If it were Biden, it would be a different story. With all that in mind, let's now dive into what Harris's path to victory may look like.
In my last election preview that I did, I mapped out each candidate's path to victory based on what states they would win to get to 270 electoral votes. I still want to do that today, but I also want to touch on each candidate's strengths and weaknesses in terms of campaigning. Now, as I've already said, a more in-depth dive into Harris's platform and policy is coming in the near future. However, it can't hurt to give a little preview of how she's campaigning now, right? So what are Harris's strengths? Well, to point out the obvious, she's not Joe Biden and she's not super old, which as I've already explained is working very well for her. Considering she's very new to the race, the fact that she has already closed the gap on Trump in many polls is a victory for her. Like I said, election day is still three months away, so it's possible this momentum fades. However, with the way things are trending, things look promising for the Harris campaign as of now. The way they've run this campaign so far has been pretty interesting too. It is objectively smart for them to jump on Gen Z trends and attempt to win over more of the young person vote. The Harris campaign saw Charlie XCX call Kamala Brat in connection to her hit album and ran with it. Don't ask me to explain what I just said, I can't. I never thought I would say a sentence like that on my channel. But here we are. That tactic obviously won't resonate with older voters, but that's another piece of the pie. On a broader level, the Harris campaign, and many Democrats in general, are taking more shots back at Republicans. It's become a trend in recent weeks for Democrats to refer to Republicans and the GOP as just weird. And it began with Harris's new running mate, Tim Waltz, saying this on an MSNBC interview. These are these are weird people on the other side. They want to take books away. They want to be in your exam room. That's that's what it comes down to. And don't, you know, get sugarcoating this. These are weird ideas. Listen to them speak. Listen to how they talk about things. Listen to how your previous guests were right. Like you said, they've told them that they shouldn't talk about race. They can't help it. It is built into their DNA because there yeah. is no plan. There's no health care plan. There's no health care plan. There's nothing to do on this. They want to take away our alliances and leave Russia to do whatever they want. Look, they are bad on foreign policy. They are bad on the environment. They certainly have no health care plan. And they keep talking about the middle class that, as I said, a robber baron real estate guy and a venture capitalist trying to tell us they understand yeah. who we are. They don't know who we are. Since that point, I personally have seen many Republicans get pretty upset at the prospect of being called weird. It got to the point where Trump's VP pick J.D. Vance, who we'll talk about more in a bit, was asked about how he felt about being called weird, gave kind of an awkward response, and the Harris campaign took that clip and flipped it into another shot back at him. Objectively, I have to admit, I am kind of a fan of this in politics. Obviously, policy matters more, but if you're getting mad about this, you probably wouldn't be if it was your side doing the name calling. Regardless, let's move on from that. They're obviously campaigning on more than just Gen Z memes and dunking on their political opponents, but what are some of Harris's Harris's weaknesses. For one, voters don't know Harris as well as they know Trump. While those who hate Trump really hate him, those that love him are willing to go to war for him, and I'll speak more on that in a bit as well. Kamala is kind of unknown, despite the fact that she served as Biden's VP. Because of this, her track record isn't as well known either, which could make it difficult for her to resonate with certain voters, especially if said voters are getting their news from sources that paint her record in a more negative light. To put it plainly, with only a few months until the election, it's not going to be easy for Harris to convince enough voters on a whole array of issues. Issues. It will be extremely important for her to try to appeal to as many voters as possible over the next few weeks, as that would be enough to sustain her momentum. However, as of now, one of her biggest weaknesses is that she simply does not have enough campaign recognition. That may seem crazy to say, but compared to Trump, it's really not a contest. Anyways, let's say hypothetically Harris is able to win enough votes to become president. What might her path to 270 electoral votes look like? Let's bring up the map. For one, all of these states can be comfortably shaded blue based on previous election results. There won't be any shocking upsets in them. They're still all pretty comfortably blue, despite what you may be reading about a couple of them. On the other side, Trump wins all of these states that will be pretty comfortably red. This puts Harris in the lead with 226 electoral votes to Trump's 219. As previously mentioned, Harris has chosen Minnesota Governor Tim Waltz to be her running mate. It's an interesting move as Minnesota is pretty safely blue. However, Waltz has huge appeal to Midwestern middle class voters, meaning he'll likely help Harris in states like Michigan and Wisconsin. Given Harris's current polling averages in Pennsylvania, it's possible she believes she won't need Pennsylvania Governor Josh Shapiro as her vice president to win the state. Assuming her momentum continues to grow, I believe she has enough to take Pennsylvania, securing another 19 electoral votes. Now that she's at 245 votes, she only needs to win a combination of Michigan and Wisconsin or Michigan and Georgia to get to at least 270 electoral votes. And Walls could really help her in those states. That, I believe, is Harris's current most likely path to victory. She's not polling as closely to Trump in states like Arizona, Nevada, and North Carolina, but states like Michigan, Wisconsin, Georgia, and Pennsylvania are where she has a great chance. She's already been campaigning in Wisconsin and gave her first official campaign address there. Additionally, it was just announced that her campaign will spend nearly $50 million in ad spending in swing states over the next few weeks. It will be very close and there isn't much room for error at all. But if Harris can pull off victories in those states, she will be the next president.
This section about the Donald might be a tiny bit shorter than the one I did on Kamala. That's not because of any bias I have against him, but because I've already somewhat covered his path to victory in previous videos. Anyways, let's get into his campaign strengths. For one, as I've already kind of mentioned, his voter base is insanely loyal. It's probably one of the most loyal bases we've ever seen in politics, and that's not hyperbole. That's important because as we've already kind of seen, it doesn't matter what he says or does. There's still a group of people in the US who are going to go to the polls for him, and they're going to go all out. Another Another very smart campaign strategy on Trump's end has been how he's repeatedly distanced himself from Project 2025. He originally claimed to know nothing about it, but has gone further to decry the ideas as too extreme. You may not believe him when he says that, but other voters will, and it's a good play by his campaign to distance himself from something that many view as crazy ideas. His backlash of the project even made the head of the Heritage Foundation, Paul Dan, step down. That doesn't mean the project is gone entirely, but some moderate voters will likely look at that and think that Trump is taking a more centrist approach for his second term. In terms of weaknesses, there's one that stands out more than others, and that's J.D. Vance. Trump's pick for vice president has kind of been a disaster so far. Let me tell you why. I kind of take back everything I said about this guy in my last video. There is zero chance he would defeat Kamala in a general election. His aura kind of sucks, and people are beginning to realize that. Here's how his favorability ratings have trended over the past week or two as of July 31st. It's clearly getting worse. But why? What's so bad about him? Well, for one, it's been reported that Trump didn't even want the guy as his VP. He wanted to go with North Dakota Governor Doug Burgum a far safer choice, but Trump's two sons apparently convinced him to go with Vance instead. Since then, things have kind of been going downhill. This guy has been a punching bag for Democrats. The Harris campaign has repeatedly targeted both his policy and beliefs. Other people online have taken a less serious approach and started a rumor about Vance writing in his best-selling book Hillbilly Elegy that he had, to put it politely, sexual relations with a couch. That joke got taken so far that the AP had to put out a fact check about the claim and wrote that Vance didn't actually have sex with a couch. However, the AP then removed the fact check from their website the next day, claiming that it did not meet their editorial standards. In other words, they could confirm that Vance didn't actually write about doing that, but they couldn't confirm what he's done in his spare time. And if you think this is something that was only in a certain corner of the internet, you're mistaken. This thing went mainstream, as evidenced by how many people were searching for the term Vance Couch on Google. There's also a ton of media coverage about it now. Once again, another thing I can't believe I'm talking about in a video. Politics in 2024, everyone. There are so many other things Democrats have already already given Vance problems for that I can't cover in this video. His old tweets, old podcast clips, and other old media appearances have all been dug up. It seriously feels like the Trump campaign didn't really vet this guy much before picking him, and you're seeing his favorability plummet as a result. That is one of Trump's biggest weaknesses heading into the election. But anyways, how does he win this thing? Well, based on the way things are going, it seems like Trump's best shot at winning comes out west and down south. Let's bring up the map again. As previously mentioned, Trump will win all of these red states, Kamala will win all of these blue states, and she'll lead 226 to 219. After that, where can Trump pick up votes? Let's start with Arizona. While Biden won it in 2020, the margin was very slim, and the state still remains polling in favor of Trump in averages despite Harris now being his opponent. Assuming he takes Arizona, that takes Donald to 230 electoral votes, which puts him at 40 away from winning. After Arizona, we're also going to give him North Carolina. Polling suggests the race may be tight here, especially with state governor Roy Cooper campaigning heavily for Harris. However, previous election trends suggest it'll go red. Trump will need it in order to win in 2024. That gives him an additional 16 electoral votes and places him at 246 total. With those two swing states in the bag, all Trump would need to win is securing Wisconsin and Michigan, as that would put him at 271 electoral votes. He could also go with Georgia and Michigan, or Georgia and Wisconsin. All of those combinations would put him at above 270 and crown him as the next president of the United States. As I've previously mentioned, this is shaping up to be a very tight race. These seven swing states all have tremendous impact, but it is very possible the election will be decided entirely by the likes of Wisconsin, Michigan, and Georgia. Those are the states that will either push Harris or Trump over the 270 mark. Trump will obviously need others, and Kamala will too, but the most overlap in terms of winning scenarios comes in those states. Be prepared, everyone. Things are about to get even crazier than they already are. As I mentioned at the beginning of this video, we're only about three months out now from election day, and all eyes are on the seven swing states we just went over. Despite heavy Democratic momentum at the moment, I don't think this election will be a landslide for either side. We're looking at a pretty close race as of now, and both candidates must now make the case to the American people as to why they're the best choice to lead this country. Like I said earlier, I'll have a Kamala Harris platform deep dive coming soon so that you can all learn a bit more about her. Stay tuned for that. Anyways, that's all I've got for this hypothetical. If you enjoyed it, please 
please feel free to like and subscribe. More videos coming soon. If you're interested in learning more about this topic, feel free to check out all of my sources in the description down below. I highly recommend it as it'll probably give you some more insight on where I got all this info from. Another thing, if you're watching this video a few weeks to a few months after it was posted, it's very possible that some of the info in it is out of date. I'm doing the best I can with the info I have as of now, but things are constantly changing. Just keep that in mind. Thank you for all your continued support. I really appreciate it. Hope I see you for my next video. Take care.